In this tutorial, we're going to be talking about attenuation. This is in part because it's useful as a foundation for understanding radiation protection, so how shielding manages to block beams. Talking about it is also useful for developing understanding of beam properties, like the beam energy spectrum and quality. It also gets us closer to our goal of understanding dose distributions inside patients. This topic is also a goldmine for people looking to write exam questions, like what is a linear attenuation coefficient, what does it mean, what are its units, etc. Questions on this stuff are very easy to write, so it tends to pop up quite frequently on exams. In the last tutorial, we talked about how individual photons interact with matter. In this tutorial, we're going to be talking about whole beams, so how large collections of photons interact as they pass through something. As I said last time, you can't actually predict when an individual photon is going to hit something or how it's going to interact. It's what we call a stochastic process. Basically, that means that individually, you have no idea what's going to happen. But when you look at large populations of something, for example, a beam containing a large number of photons, we can get quite a precise estimate of what's going to happen on the whole. So when it comes to photon beams, we can predict how many on average are going to interact as they travel a certain distance through a medium. The loss of photons as a beam travels through a medium is called attenuation. This happens as a result of the photon interaction types we talked about in the last tutorial, such as the photoelectric effect and Compton scattering. But attenuation is looking at this on a bigger scale in terms of what happens to a beam as a whole. Now if you flip open any medical physics textbook to a chapter on attenuation, then first of all we're going to talk to you about exponential attenuation. Basically what this looks like is that the intensity of your beam, so the number of photons inside it, varies with the depth traveled through a medium in a fashion that looks like this. It means that when you have a lot of photons, such as at very shallow depths, the intensity drops off very, very quickly, so lots of photons mean lots of interactions. But when you have fewer, like when your depth is greater, it drops off more slowly, so when you have fewer photons, you get fewer interactions. It's only a pure exponential relationship between attenuated thickness and beam intensity when the beam contains photons of only one energy, and when the presence of scattered photons is ignored. Pure exponential attenuation will follow this equation here where i is a final intensity, so the number of photons you have left after your beam passes through a certain thickness of material, i0 is the number of photons that you start with, so the number of photons that you have before a beam passes through a material and is attenuated, e is the number e, its presence is what makes this equation exponential, it's roughly 2 and a bit. This Greek letter mu is the attenuation coefficient, which determines how quickly a medium attenuates a beam, and t is the thickness of the material that your beam passes through. Now this equation doesn't have to be all about i or intensity, it can also be cast in terms of fluence or energy fluence, where fluence is the number of photons that's passing through a certain volume, and energy fluence is just a fluence times the energy of the particles. You don't need to know anything in detail about these yet, but they can be useful in advanced dose calculation algorithms using radiotherapy treatment planning systems, such as everybody's favorite, the collapsed cone convolution algorithm. True exponential attenuation is something that we in BITIS call an ideal situation, meaning something that doesn't actually occur in reality. Exponential attenuation only holds true for monoenergetic beams, so photon beams that only contain particles of one energy. Radiotherapy photon beams are always polyenergetic to some degree, in that they're made up of photons of different energies. And attenuation is only truly exponential when there is no scattered radiation, which is never true in reality. But this equation here, while it may not necessarily hold rigorously true in real life, it can be useful as part of a more complicated method of dose calculation, such as the superposition algorithm I mentioned before. The reason that you only see true exponential attenuation in monoenergetic beams is that photons with different energies experience attenuation at different rates. So photons of one energy will attenuate at a rate like this. Photons of a lower energy will attenuate at a rate like this. Photons of a higher energy will attenuate at a rate like this. So photons with a higher energy are attenuated at a lower rate when passing through a material than those with a lower energy. If a beam contains multiple energies, the attenuation curve will be an average of the curve for each of the energy components within. The reason that exponential attenuation doesn't hold true in the presence of scattered photons is that attenuation only tells you what proportion of your beam has actually hit something. It doesn't tell you anything about what happens to it next. Say for example you have a collection of photons hitting these particles here. See, half of the photons have hit something, and half of them have made it through. So you can say that half of our beam has been attenuated. If you think back to the photon interactions that we've been over previously, not all of the photons that interact with matter are absorbed. If these photons that hit something undergo Compton interactions, for example, the photons don't lose all of their energy, they're simply scattered. These photons, even though they've hit something and technically been attenuated, are still passing through the patient. So this curve here, if it's exponential, it tells you at what rate your beam hits stuff. But if the photons that hit stuff aren't removed from your beam, if they keep passing through the patient, as tends to happen in radiotherapy beams, there's going to be a lot more photons left at depth than exponential attenuation will lead you to believe. This results in the actual intensity of photons dropping off more slowly with depth. A linear attenuation coefficient tells you how rapidly your beam is going to be absorbed as it travels through something. It's often denoted by the letter mu, depending on the photon energy, the material through which the beam is passing, and has units of per centimeter. Or just any distance, really, but we tend to use per centimeter in radiotherapy. It describes what proportion of a beam's photons are lost per distance traveled in a medium. So the higher the linear attenuation coefficient, the more quickly the beam is absorbed as it travels through something. The mass attenuation coefficient is basically the linear attenuation coefficient 
divided by the density of the material. So the linear attenuation coefficient of a photon beam passing through a medium depends on the photon energy, the medium composition, and the medium density. So if we divide the linear attenuation coefficient by the density of the medium, it no longer depends on the density, which makes it a bit more simple to handle, tabulate, and use for calculations. This tends to be the form of the attenuation coefficient of the final books. When I talked about the impact of scattered radiation on the shape of the attenuation curve, I mentioned that not all photons that interact are absorbed. When looking at a beam of photons passing through a round, tumor-shaped lump, attenuation calculations can tell us what proportion of photons are going to interact inside it. So attenuation tells us about the number of photons that interact. Now we're going to talk about the energy deposition, which is a really, really important part of radiotherapy. Photons are a form of indirectly ionizing radiation. They cause tissue damage by interacting and transferring energy to secondary electrons, which then go on to cause a majority of the ionization and damage inside the patient. So the amount of energy that a photon loses during an interaction and then passed to a secondary electron is the amount of energy that is transferred to the medium. We're going to talk about this in more detail during the next tutorial. The secondary electrons don't necessarily deposit all of their energy via collisions. Sometimes they re-emit their energy as a photon, which can escape from the tumor volume. In this case, it's termed a radiative loss. It's the amount of energy that secondary electrons use to bump into things and cause ionization that causes most of the tissue damage in radiotherapy. So therefore, it's a quantity that we're most interested in. This is the energy absorbed, which is equal to the energy transfer, so the amount of energy donated to secondary electrons via photons during photon interactions, minus the amount that escapes from the tumor via being re-emitted as photons. I mentioned before that radiotherapy beams are polyenergetic. They're made up of a whole spectrum of different energies. If this axis is photon energy in MeV, and this axis is a number of photons at each energy, the beam's energy spectrum will generally look something like this. It will have a maximum energy. Say, if this is 6 mega electron volts, we'd say this is a 6 MV beam, because we label radiotherapy beams based on their maximum energy, and in doing so, we omit the E. Generally, the beam is mostly composed of photons with a much lower energy, but they usually contain far fewer photons of very low energies, because we tend to filter these out in clinical practice. If the beam wasn't filtered, the number of photons would continue to increase as the energy decreases, like this. It's important to note that this sort of spectrum is characteristic of a man-made X-ray beam, such as those produced by X-ray tubes or linear accelerators, but not those produced by radioactive sources like cobalt-60. The rate of photon attenuation depends upon the energy, so it will be different for every single part of a polyenergetic X-ray spectrum. As I mentioned before, you can still apply this equation to polyenergetic beams, but you must apply it individually to each energy component. Higher energy components of the spectrum are attenuated more slowly, and therefore have a lower linear attenuation coefficient than those at the lower end of the spectrum. What that means is that when passing through material, different parts of the spectrum are going to be attenuated at different rates. This spectrum here still has a lot of its low energy components. So let's say that it hasn't passed through anything yet. It's passed through a material thickness of zero. Once this beam has passed through a little bit of material, you see that the low energy part of the spectrum has actually decreased relative to the high energy part. This is because the lower energy part of the spectrum has a higher linear attenuation coefficient in this material. The lower energy part of the spectrum is being filtered out. So as the beam passes through more material, the lower energy part of the spectrum is attenuated more and more. This is a process that's known as beam hardening. It's a preferential attenuation of low energy beam components. It usually occurs in materials with a high atomic number due to photoelectric interactions. Since photoelectric interactions are more likely when photon energies are low and the atomic number of the material is high. So when a beam passes through a high atomic number of material, its lower energy components become very likely to undergo the photoelectric interaction. This is why they disappear at a higher rate than the higher energy components, which tend to undergo the Compton interaction instead, the likelihood of which doesn't increase when passing through a high atomic number of material. The inverse can also occur when a very high energy beam passes through a very high atomic number of material. This is known as beam softening. This is because when very high energy beams pass through high atomic number of materials, the pair production effect becomes more likely, so the higher energy of the spectrum becomes more likely to interact than the lower energy parts. When a beam's average energy is increased via filtration, it's said to be hardy. When a beam's energy is decreased by a filtration, it's said to be soft. Hard equals high energy, and soft equals low energy. Beam hardening is often desirable in radiotherapy, since a higher beam energy means that dose can be deposited deeper inside the patient. In the context of kilovoltage radiotherapy, the maximum dose is always been delivered to the skin. But as beam energy increases, the ratio of dose at the depth that we may actually want to treat to the dose at the skin surface increases. This allows us to give a higher dose of something underneath the skin, whilst reducing the dose of the skin itself. This has historically been very important when kilovoltage radiotherapy was a primarily available modality. Skin dose and the resulting burn were the primary limiting factor for how much dose could be given to structures underneath the skin. So higher beam energies allowed higher doses to be given to tumors at depth beneath the skin. This was achieved both by using high voltage x-ray generators and also via beam filtration, which makes use of the beam hardening effect demonstrated on the previous slide. Kilovoltage beams are still used today to treat superficial tumors like skin cancers. The beams are hardened using aluminium and or copper filters.
While beam filtration does remove low energy components of the beam and thus increase the average energy and depth of penetration, it also decreases the dose rate. It makes sense because the more material you pass a beam through, the fewer photons are going to come out the other side. So beam filtration is a trade-off, increasing the average energy of the beam at the expense of the dose rate. If this is taken to extremes, it can make treatment times effectively long. But this ratio can be optimized through proper selection of materials, which is going to be discussed in the next tutorial on combination filters.